One country, two sides, three exclaves, four people groups, and a lot of confusing lines that can give even the most seasoned Uber driver a level five seizure. It's time to learn geography. No! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbie. If you don't know anything about Cyprus, all you really have to know is that it's an island with a lot of fine wine and landmines, a lot of barbecue and barbed wire, spa resorts and spies resorting to spying on... Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> the more complex a country is divided administratively, the more I love doing these episodes. I imagine this is how a doctor feels when they go into surgery, removing tumors and transplanting organs and stuff. All right, uh, let's take out this exclave, and uh, here's uh, an autonomous republic. Doctor, remember the border blockades and checkpoint stations. Oh, right, uh, we'll need 50 cc's of legislative tension. Stop. Let's jump in. Cyprus, an island nation, is located in the eastern Mediterranean Sea, just off the coast of Turkey and Syria and Lebanon in the Middle East. If you look at a satellite image of Cyprus, you'll see this nice little beigey, semi-arid island with a uniquely pointed tail at the east end. But if you look at a political map, you'll see this. One thing you'll immediately notice about Cyprus is that the entire country is split by a huge demilitarized line known as the UN buffer zone. This line spans 180 kilometers, or 112 miles, from Paralimni to Katopirgo. The country is divided into six districts, however, two of these districts overlap the buffer zone, so it's kind of like eight districts, but not really, but kind of. If you ask a northern Cypriot, they'll tell you that their side contains five districts split like this. Now, why is there a UN buffer zone? Because since the 70s, Cyprus has been divided into two separate main entities, the Greek Cypriot area in the south that makes up about 60% of the island, and the Turkish Cypriot side that takes about 36%. The remaining 4% belong to the UK and the UN. The UK operates the two overseas territories of Akrotiri and Dekelia on the southern coast of the country. These places are operated by the British military forces, although Greek Cypriots are totally allowed to enter and pass through the domain, just not enter the actual bases without permission. Tekeli is even more confusing as it's the only part of the country that effectively cuts off the UN buffer zone from itself and holds three Cypriot exclaves, pronounced this way. On top of that, you have the Akna Road that acts like a single artery that connects Tekeli to its inland Ios Nicolas station. Now, when it comes to the UN buffer zone, most maps typically don't do a good job explaining exactly how it works. It's more like a quadruple border with four four lines that are only a few meters wide that run along each other instead of two. These big areas still have fully operating towns and communities that lie within the parallel buffer parameters like the town of Athino or Truloi, but they do have double checkpoints when going north or south. It's really confusing. It's like a part of Cyprus, but surrounded by the UN. Where it does get weird though is the capital city, Nicosia, which acts as a capital for both the north and south parts of the country. This is where the most notable division can be found, and it's kind of weird. Walls and gates slice right through the city, which have left certain buildings and streets untouched and abandoned for over four decades. The biggest casualty of the division, though, would have to be the old airport, Nicosia International, which is all but abandoned and empty today. If you want to fly to Cyprus today, you will either have to arrive at Larnaca or Paphos Airport in the south part, or Erkan Airport for northern Cyprus. Finally, you have the strange Kokina exclave that operates under the Turkish northern Cypriot area as a military base, cut off by the rest of the entity from another separate UN buffer zone. Now, regardless of all these barriers and walls, you can still cross over the sides. Today, there are seven checkpoints, and it's not that that hard. All you do is you just show your passport to both the Greek and Turkish police and then head through. If you go by car, you will need to purchase new insurance on the side that you're entering and you'll only be allowed to stay for up to 30 days. So that's about it. Simple, right? All right, let's move on. Cyprus is said to be the legendary birthplace of Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty. And despite all the barbed wire and abandoned buildings, this country still holds its ground in aesthetics. First of all, the country has a dry, relatively warm Mediterranean climate with rainfall in the winter months. Cyprus is made up of two main mountain chains, the rugged Troldos chain in the southwest, which contains the highest point of the country, Mount Olympus. Yeah, they kind of copied Greece on that one. And the smaller Kyrenia mountains that parallel the north coast. The country has only seasonal rivers that flow from the mountain snowmelt after wintertime. Otherwise, most rivers dry up by summertime, leaving empty riverbeds. The government has really tried to combat the irrigation problem by building dams and reservoirs to supplement the crop fields during the drier months. After the split, the north side took most of the grain and citrus and all of the tobacco fields. However, the south took most of the fruit orchards, livestock, and vegetable fields, and nearly all of the grape vineyards. Beautiful beaches line the coast of all sides with shrubs and eroded rock cliffs like the Aia Napa Beach. Trees are taken seriously now as deforestation has hit the country hard in the past half century. Only about 17 percent of the country is classified as woodland and logging is heavily monitored. It's actually totally legal to take figs and olives off of your neighbor's tree, but illegal to cut down the tree even if you own it. Speaking of neighborly interaction, let's jump into the most controversial part of this episode. Ugh, controversy, controversy. We need a distraction. Here's a Korean guy playing the bagpipes. 
So as you could kind of gather from the previous two segments, Cyprus is kind of divided. Essentially, the country is populated by two main ethnic groups that have quite an interesting history on the island. First of all, Cyprus has a population around 1.2 million and it has the highest percentage in the EU of working adults with tertiary education. Although the numbers are a little hazy and debatable, the entire island is made up of about 77% Greek Cypriots and about 18% Turkish Cypriots. The remaining 5% come from a wide range of other nationalities like Armenians, British, Russian, and even a sizable Vietnamese community has settled in the country as well. Now here's where we finally address the elephant in the room. How on earth did all this internal conflict arise on such a small island? And by small island, I mean the third largest in the Mediterranean. Well, not getting too deep into history, Cyprus has gone through a lot of crazy times in the past few millennia. The earliest recorded documents show that it was first inhabited by the Mycenaean Greeks, and then the Assyrians, Egyptians, Persians, and then the Greeks again, and then the Egyptians again, then the Roman Empire, then the Arab Caliphates, the French, the Venetians, and then the Ottomans for like three centuries, and then finally the British until they broke free and became annexed in 1914, and then independent by 1960. And that's when the real domestic conflict began. Long story short, 1974 was the year when all the fighting went down, and this became a thing. To this day, Turkey is the only country that recognizes the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus as a sovereign state, whereas the Republic of Cyprus kind of acts as the poster child for the entire island on the world stage. So that's why Cyprus looks the way it does, and that's all I'm gonna say. The funny thing is, most Cypriots today, north or south, want a reunification plan and think the whole division is just a stubborn older generation problem that shouldn't be carried out today. Culture-wise, of course, Greek Cypriots are incredibly influenced by Greece and Greek culture. However, they do speak with a pretty interesting dialect that sometimes even Greek people from the mainland have a little trouble understanding. Many of the words have a slight Turkish or Arabic undertone, and there's a whole slew of Cypriot slang that isn't even used in standard Greek. Northern Turkish Cypriots, of course, identify closest to Turkey. Both sides, although heavily identified with their respective cultural religions, Islam for the North and Greek Orthodox for the South, the countries are both run under secular governmental systems. Most women in Northern Cyprus don't even wear headscarves, let alone typical conservative Muslim dresses, and alcohol is sold and drunken everywhere. One thing that really sticks out, though, would be the proficiency in English. Since Cyprus was under British rule for a while, English became the de facto language, and around 80% of the country actually speaks it. Of course, Greek and Turkish are the official languages, but English signs and translations can be found everywhere, and typically you can strike up a conversation in English with most people on the island, especially the younger generation. This also helps out when the tourists start flocking in, which makes up a huge portion of Cyprus's economy. Let's talk about the interactions they have with outsiders. Remember how in the Bosnia and Herzegovina episode we mentioned how the friend of your enemy can sometimes by default end up being your friend as well? Well, that's kind of how it works with Cyprus. When asking who their friends are, you kind of have to address which side of Cyprus you're referring to. If you're asking in the north, then of course they'll say Turkey and all the friends that come along with the package with Turkey, like Azerbaijan or Pakistan and Afghanistan and so on. If you ask the Greek Cypriot side of Cyprus, you'll probably get a different response. As part of the EU, Cyprus is kind of like the new guy that walked into the party with a few scars that everybody is slightly intrigued by keeps their eye on as he walks over to the punch bowl. Israel and Armenia have always been close and many Armenians live in Cyprus and Armenian is a recognized minority language. Israel shares the same Western value of free market and trade as well as free democracy. When it comes to their best friend, however, hands down, no doubt, the Republic of Cyprus will tell you that Greece is their best friend. Cyprus is the only other fully sovereign state in which Greek is the official language and heritage of the residents. Cypriots and Greeks absolutely love each other and will always have each other's backs. In conclusion, the island nation of Cyprus is a beautiful, well-educated, economically stable hot mess. Who knows what it'll look like in the future, but let's hope it involves fewer blockades and more block parties. Stay tuned, the Czech Republic, also known as Czechia, is coming up next.